so we've talked about these items. You know, what we're going to do here is introduce a new segment. Uh, we're going to talk about the uh, threat track top five. And, you know, in these scenarios, we're talking about some things where ultimately your information might be stolen. And so the question is, okay, you suspect your identity has been stolen, and what are you going to do at this point? So, uh, you know, I guess what we'll do is talk about a few things. I'll take the first one here and just basically say, you know, you want to first find out what data has been stolen. And perhaps, you know, if you can, you'd like to know who has it because uh, who has it might have some implications on how they might use it. You know, there's a, there's a lot of press out there now about the OPM compromise. And so the question is, you know, this information is stolen, what, what might they do with it? Well, in that particular case, at least the suspicion is what they're talking about is that they're probably not gonna, you know, try to open credit cards in your, uh, under your name. Uh, it probably has more to do with some strategy to be able to, uh, you know, do some sort of cyber attack against the government or something along those lines. But in any case, understanding what the data is that's been stolen, what they might be able to do with it, and what the motivations might be, would be uh, perhaps a helpful factor. So I don't. Know, what's uh, what do two, you think, John? Number two yeah. on the list. <laughs> number um, two. <laughs> so yeah, I guess the the number two item that we always talk about is you should probably change. As long as you know to the extent of what identities have been stolen from you, you should change your password at least on that environment or those environments. But I would recommend changing passwords on most of your systems if you can, because you, especially if you reuse the login ID, like the mm -hmm. same user ID, we always say never use the same password on any two systems or three, whatever. I always use a unique password on mm -hmm. each system. Um, and I know a lot of people probably don't follow that rule, but there are things like password safe and some of these other password safe programs that will help you create unique passwords for each site. I got um, a feeling we're going to talk about something like that later. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah, we might. Well, that's a whole other issue. But in any event, uh, you know, uh, definitely you know, yeah. change your passwords on these systems yeah, uh, to, to prevent any chance of somebody using that information to get yeah. into your system. Yeah, they, you know, uh, change, so in a case where identity information has been stolen, it's a good possibility that other aspects of the information have been stolen. And uh, you know, sometimes they are they're able to get the password hashes and perhaps use that right, to be able to get them. access to other systems. So you certainly want to be able to, to uh, protect against that. And you know, you know, considering the type of identity information that might have been stolen, they might be able to guess some of your security questions. Yes. So that's one thing to also systems. keep in mind. Yeah, yeah so I mean, if that's stolen in there and there's some security questions and there's another site somewhere else that you use that has the same mm -hmm. security questions or has some overlap, that right. could be a problem. They may yeah. be able to reset your password on you without, mm -hmm. you know, just by answering security questions. You know, it, I, um, it, the, there's, there's sort of a philosophy that says you should actually generate lies for the security questions and use those, I mean, they're effectively sort of pieces and parts of your password. And uh, so if you keep track of your passwords, kind of keep track of what the answers to their questions are, and they can be completely fictitious or false. Right. So, right. All right, so let's, uh, <laughs> let's go to you, Manny. What do you think about number three here? So yeah, so number three, uh, being alert uh, for spear phishing. So spear phishing obviously is a huge, we know that's uh, one of the, I think one of the major uh, initial vectors for, mm -hmm. uh, for getting, um, you know, getting compromised credentials and stuff. So, you know, what you have to be suspicious, you know, you, what you have to work, uh, watch out for is is for these suspicious looking emails, right? And I think um, we've done quite a bit in terms of, you know, training, employee training, learning to figure out what, you know, what's right, what I should click, what I shouldn't click, looking at uh, uh, links and making sure that you know, understand where they're going to. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously that is an important step in, in because once, once your uh, credentials have been compromised, what you have to expect is that there is the potential for being spearfished, mm -hmm. right? So once they know who you are, they may actually start going after you, especially if the initial information that they're gathering on you is enough to mm -hmm. get a really good spear phishing email towards you, right? The All more right. that they understand about you, the better that spear phishing email will actually look. Yeah. What I would say is wherever the data breach occurred, be it you know a, a retail store or a government agency, they may try and send you messages, legitimate messages from that organization, but the spear fishers may also try and pretend to be that organization. Right, right. I mean, we've yeah. seen that with the Target and Home Depot breaches, where as soon as the breach was in the news, 
the fishers were using that saying, oh, we, right. you know, we know that you got compromised, please click on this site and sign up for protection. But yeah. that's the fish. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah, so it's not necessarily a spear fish. Right. It could be a, a, a fish in general. You know, the, the, yeah. the, and I think sometimes these, these are perhaps mixed up, but the, you know, the distinction between your typical fish, fishing activity, you know, this is obviously an analogy to, you know, fishing with a rod. I had a friend that actually lived off of uh, on, on Long Island. He used to go spear fishing, and it involved diving deep, and you know you have to target a fish, and you actually have to you know kind of jab at it under the water, <laughs> and meanwhile be holding your breath, and then finally come up and start over again. <laughs> it's a significantly more work than just throwing some bait in the water and hoping that the fish comes to you. So, <laughs> so, yeah. so your your point well taken. They have the opportunity to spearfish you, be very targeted in their attack, but they also have the opportunity to take a media event and uh, you know just throw some bait in the water and see who 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 grabs on. Matt, how about number <laughs> number <Sure>. four? <laughs> number four. So. Um, Notify the parties involved, and especially if these parties are a bank mm -hmm. or a credit card or any sort of financial institution or a person you may have financial dealings with. Because in, in many cases, they'll have tools available or methods to protect or prevent further compromise. Right. So, for example, if, 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 you're, if it's a bank you were compromised by, and hopefully the, they will be providing some sort of identity protection service, whether this is identity, like a notification service to say, oh, by the way, someone just opened a new line credit in your name, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's, that's nice. <laughs> I would have wished that you had told me before it had occurred. <laughs> that's a possibility. Yeah. Um, in some cases, you can also set up a credit freeze, which is right. something I think uh, Brian Krebs mentioned in a recent blog post where you can actually say, don't allow any changes for the next uh, three months mm -hmm. um, and let me know if anybody tries to do anything. Yeah, so unless you're planning on replacing your car. Well, that's that's the thing. If you if you buy a new home, if you intend to, yeah. to need to take out a line of credit somewhere, this does get yeah. in your way. You can turn it back off. I think they offer a, a PIN number yeah, to okay. you. You can go back and say, "This is me. Here's my PIN. I'd like to turn this off, please." Mm -hmm. um, but in general, you know, take advantage of whatever protections are out there from these organizations and let them know that this is the, this is the case. They may not know. They mm -hmm. may know. Well, and in fact, it may be uh, helpful to them to know that you as an individual, perhaps, because you may have gotten a notification through another third party that they may not have known that that credit card number, for example, had been stolen. Yeah. By letting them know, uh, it gives them an opportunity to be looking for the potential fraud because that may translate to other victims. So you may be not just protecting yourself, but helping the organization protect others. So uh, that can be pretty valuable. You know, the, uh, the banks have gotten a lot more proactive about looking for fraud activities or even looking for evidence of stolen credit cards. Yes. And they've been using that to help translate that or, or correlate that back to organizations that have been, you know, basically the victims of the theft, retail organizations, for example. And Brian Krebs, I think, has reported a number of those. He mentioned them. And so uh, having that information will help them to be able to trace it back possibly as well. So, all right, so Manny, what do you think is number five here? <clears throat> so number five, uh, subscribe to a identity theft protection service. So I personally have some st strong thoughts about it, um, <laughs> but it, it's uh, it's obviously a good uh, a good thing to do once you've known that that you, p potentially there's been a, a compromise. Mm -hmm. Now, in many cases, depending on the size of the of the, the compromise, this may actually be offered to you mm -hmm. as sort of consolation. Um, so sort of sorry after the fact kind mm -hmm. of thing, um, but but if it if it isn't, then obviously subscribing or signing up to uh, to one of these services is is a good idea. You know, at least you have somebody there that's paying attention to the, the, the credit side of your you know of your identity mm -hmm. to make sure that you get alerted when something sort of suspicious happens. Right. So. So and as you can see, there's sort of a theme here. You know, they're changed some things, and then the other aspect is really just kind of have some good understanding of what's going on around you and try to get some help along the way. So uh, perhaps keeping track of a lot of them for of uh, activities that are taking place, uh, watching for transactions that are taking place, I think is uh, sort of the common theme here. Yeah. Right. And I was just going to interject these identity theft protection services. While you know they're not 100% guaranteed they're going to pick up. Um, and when they do, sometimes it's inconvenient for you. It's a lot more, it's a lot better to be inconvenienced every now mm -hmm. and then 
than to get you know have somebody open a credit card and then use it for ten thousand dollars or something mm -hmm. and then you have to go through the whole process of you know trying to repair yeah, your it. credit yeah. and uh trying not to have to pay that bill and whatnot yeah so yeah.